Good evening and welcome to Watchman on the Wall. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we're going to address the topic of corruption in South Africa. Bongani, corruption is probably the greatest challenge facing South Africa today. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, when I look at it, uh, we, we always, when we see things like poverty, unemployment, crime and, and such things, people always um, complain, you know, why aren't things working? And somewhere in there, there's an underlining, you know, finger blaming at our father who is in heaven for maybe not providing and not taking care of his people. But if you really look at it, uh, if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, the amount of um, money that's in the world in terms of the GDP and expenditure and so on, there is enough money and enough resources around for that's all right. the people. So our father has done his job in terms of providing for all of us. What really needs to happen is the people who are managing those resources need to do a good job, be That's good right. stewards and have efficiencies and so on. And corruption is a killer. It takes away the money that should be going Corruption is really eating like a cancer it internally away at the future prosperity and stability of this nation. And we need to face this um, challenge head on. Recently in Parliament, the Auditor General announced that 26 billion rand was thrown down a pit. Mm. When missing, nobody can explain where this money has gone to due to corruption. Now in a nation with so much need, so much poverty, so much unemployment, that has to be unacceptable, Bongani. That is unacceptable. I mean, the other um, news um, headline that we read, the other story that's been trailing in the, in the newspapers and so on, is about the 50 million that was spent on a website by the Free State um, uh, Provincial Government. That's I right. mean, 50 million on a website. That money that could have certainly been used to address some other need. So once again, I'm back to where, to where I started. You know, my belief that our Father who's in heaven has provided for all of us. There's enough resources available. It's all about those people who are managing the resources, who are in positions of authority, that they use those resources effectively, efficiently, and they use it correctly. Now, we've taken the Watchman on the Wall cameras to an initiative that's been launched in Cape Town recently called Expose. This is a major initiative and I believe a very necessary one uh, considering what is happening in South Africa that can help you and me blow the whistle on corruption in South Africa. So please stay with us as we show you the launch of Expose recently here in Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this evening's uh, Exposed Press and Partner brother and sister event. It's wonderful to have you here this evening. And so we are six months uh, into our campaign, having launched in October last year uh, in London, a glorious event. And uh, tonight we have the great, great privilege and pleasure of uh, making known to you and to the rest of the world uh, as we rise from this evening's proceedings, press releases will go out throughout all of the world um, that make public the, uh, the toolkits that we have for church and for business, and very, very importantly, uh, the Global Call Action Tool, which we'll tell you a little bit more about in a little while. So um, what I'd like to do this evening is uh, I'd like to open with a word of prayer, and then I want to introduce the first of our preeminent speakers. So let us pray. Loving God, as we gather, we recognize that there are women and men, children and the elderly, all across the world who long to experience your justice. And Father, as we gather, we, we thank you for the immeasurable privilege of being part of the great work that you are doing across the world. We thank you for the nearly two billion Christians that you have raised up in churches in every country on earth and today we pray for your church and we ask that you would once again pour out your holy spirit on this gathering at the southern tip of africa throughout this nation this continent and into the whole world that the earth may see our good deeds and glorify you god in heaven we pray, loving God, that as we meet this evening, that you would speak to us through the scriptures, that you would encourage us through the practical actions and the work that has been done in this campaign. We do pray, Lord, that as each of these speakers comes to address us, that you would give them great clarity of heart and mind, and that the words that they speak would encourage us here and encourage us throughout the world. And so, Father, thank you for the person who 
has come who is on our left and the person who is on our right. And we do pray that you would speak to each one and bless them this evening. This is your time and we are your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, sisters and brothers, it gives me great joy to introduce to you this evening our first speaker, Dr. Michael Cassidy. I don't think he needs too much of an introduction. Michael, they say that you can always tell the importance of a person by how short their introduction is. For example, when you're in America, they just say, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And there you go. <laughs> So I'm going to make your introduction short this evening uh, because the Lord has blessed us through you over many years. For those of us who live in Africa, we would certainly know Dr. Michael Cassidy as the founder of Africa Enterprise, uh, a great leader on our continent and here in this nation. Uh, Dr. Cassidy is also the honorary life president of the Luzon Movement, which is a great blessing, Michael, for us to know that we have you in this nation taking up that role. And uh, Dr. Cassidy also happens to be uh, a patron of the Global Day of Prayer and Unashamedly Ethical Movements. Michael, it's a great joy and honor for us to listen to you tonight. Welcome. I feel honored and humbled and privileged by being asked to come and share at this moment uh, as we consider the forward movement of the exposed venture that seeks to shine a light on corruption and also to combat crime. I've been asked to share fairly specifically on the importance of the church in God's plan to re redeem and renew the world and the role of Christians, if you like, in the work of transforming society. But uh, of course, if one thinks of a topic such as the church's role in transforming society, one finds oneself facing two questions. The first question is, should the church even try to do such a thing? Or shouldn't we just confine ourselves to our private or semi-private teaching and preaching and have just simply a privatized religion? On the other hand, question two, if the church is meant to go beyond privatized religion and its own internal agenda, and try to influence society and the world, how does one do it? I, I thought and prayed a bit about how to bring my comments on this, and I thought I would take, what, what came into my mind was really just to share with you a little bit of testimony and a little bit of story uh, on this particular issue. I grew up in old Basutland, land, <coughs> now Lesotho, uh, living next door to a man called Patrick Duncan. He was son of the Governor General, former Governor General <clears throat> of South Africa. He was passionate about ju social justice and a committed foe of apartheid. He was also one of the founders with Alan Payton of the South African Liberal Party. He was my childhood hero. And before I was 12, I had been politicized by him into believing that society needed to be changed. And the way to do it was politics and political involvement. And I became deeply concerned, even as a child, about South Africa. Then at age 19, I went off to university in England, where I had a tumultuous Damascus Road political conversion, I mean Christian conversion. Now I, as I came to, into that experience of Christ, I cast Pat Duncan and politics and societal engagement to outer darkness. And what I s said was that Christian conversion uh, and the new birth was all that was necessary uh, just to get people co uh, born again and converted and they would change, they would themselves change society. Then I found to my alarm that there were many so-called born-again Christians, evangelical Christians, both in South Africa and the southern states of the United States, who were implicitly and explicitly supportive of apartheid and segregation. This really shook me. So I went from the conviction that a politics is the answer to conversion that Christian evangelism was the answer and then into confusion and I'm not sure what was the answer. 1957, uh, 
in a university vacation, I found myself in North America, in New York. There I, there I saw and heard two men in vigorous Christian ministry. The first was Billy Graham, speaking in Madison Square Garden, night after night, I went to hear him, focusing mainly on the vertical uh, and personal side of the gospel. At the same time, Martin Luther King was on television daily, marching in the streets of Alabama and protesting about uh, injustice and uh, racial segregation in the South. I looked at these two men and I said, are these two different gospels? The one was focusing mainly into the vertical side and then the other into the horizontal and social. And then I, as I thought and prayed about this as a young believer relatively, I saw that these were two sides, the obverse and the reverse side of the same coin, of a holistic witness of the Christian, in, the, in the Christian gospel. And that if either dimension was missing or ignored, the fullness of the gospel was compromised. And I saw that if you have the personal without the social and societal, you have the spirit without a body, which is a ghost. If you have the social without the spiritual, you have the body without the spirit, which is a corpse. <laughs> but if you have spirit and body together, you have a living spiritual body of full holistic life and witness. And that was what I came to embrace for myself and for the Ministry of African Enterprise and what I believe the church in Southern Africa and Africa ought to be embracing as well. And that God did indeed want to redeem and renew the world and transform society. This was, this was what he mandated and wanted. And I saw that the reality was Jesus' call to the church in Matthew 5.13 to be both salt and light. Salt in the ancient world arrested decay. Light anytime, anywhere dispels darkness. And in verse 16 of that chapter, it said, let your light shine before men and that they may see your good works. And the Lord wanted our light to shine. And beloved, what I, I, I registered was that if a, country if a country decays, it is because of the failure of the church to be salt. And, and if a country becomes dark, it's because of the failure of the church to shine the light. And one of my modest conclusions after 50 years of Christian ministry is that every church gets the country it deserves. And if you look around, or if we even look around our assorted countries represented here, don't blame the government, the military, or academia, or anybody else. Let's look at ourselves. And so how are we to redeem and renew the world and transform society? How are we to do it? Seems to me there are several things that we can't miss out on. The first is we win people to Jesus Christ so that they are morally changed and spiritually reborn into a capacity for moral and spiritual life. Secondly, we disciple them to be true witnesses to Jesus Christ. And in that we are, we're, we're telling them the message, we're proclaiming the gospel of Christian salvation and new birth. We are then addressing injustice and poverty prophetically. We are salt that arrests the decay we are light that dispels darkness, and we shine light into dark places. And this latter is a special concern and program of the exposed venture, namely to shine light into the infinite number of dark places of corruption and wickedness that are ever more pervasive in our land. Shining of this light is not the whole ministry of the church, to shine light into dark places and in, 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 in places of corruption. But it is certainly a key part of it. No question about that. And as such, I commend the exposed program with all my heart, and I trust that it will prosper in these very, very needy times in our own very, very needy country. I, as I address you, brothers and sisters, on this issue of 
the role of the church with regard to this question. It's obviously a heartbreaking matter. Uh, corruption is is terrible. The corruption is a is a betrayal of the dreams of many people on this continent, and as I'm sure around the world as well. Corruption is the reason that poverty uh, is so persistent. In a very real sense, one can say that corruption is the one thing that shatters the dream of many people. There's a book written, I think, by Mwele Tsimbeki, and he writes about the fact that it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so that South Africa, being the last country in the continent to be liberated, and given the fact that a lot of the leadership of our country spent a lot of time in the different countries of the continent, and they saw firsthand what happened, for them to actually repeat the same things is such a tragedy. And, and it says that we haven't learned some of the key lessons that uh, we could have learned in post-independent uh, Africa. And so that we meet today on the 11th of March to launch this initiative is, is a, in one sense a very hopeful move, but in another it is a set uh, comment on the way we lead uh, in our country. And to be sure, the rhetoric against, the part, against corruption is there. Uh, as the General Secretary of the Evangelical Alliance, I've had opportunity to engage many of our political leadership. And the confession is a ready one that, you know, we, we don't, we admit this problem is a problem. And what we hope for or seek to do is to end it, but we don't know how. In fact, in one of the meetings that we had, the, uh, the leaders of the ruling party said to us, we are even starting a school, a political school, and our hope is that somehow in this school, people, cadres of the movement, as, the, as they're called, will learn to be patriotic, committed, and to be like leaders we've had in the past, Nelson Mandela, and so forth and so on. And the principal of this school is one that you know very well in Cape Town here, who had his own uh, challenges with the law, and it is him who must help this political school to produce the outcomes of anti-corruption that we, we need. And all of this says to me the challenge that we have and the way in which it is being addressed by secular society is in very important ways inadequate because it lacks the one vital thing that Expose brings to the table. And that one vital thing is the spiritual dimension of the problem of corruption. And so if you think about it, corruption is an abuse. At its raw bottom line sense, it is an abuse of power. When a traffic officer stops you on the road and doesn't write you a ticket for driving as you do, it is because they are corrupt if they take a bribe from you. The same thing that if a head of state takes the resources that ought to go to ending poverty and using those resources for self-interest, that is abuse of power. The same applies when a Minister of Education takes the resources that ought to go into ending uh, poverty, inequality, and unemployment by raising the outcomes of our education system, but simply doesn't do it because in one way or other, they, they are interested or they have interests in the way the business of delivering textbook uh, happens. All of that is an indication 
of the abuse of power. You can apply it even in the family. We've had a lot of gender-based violence in our country and all of which boils down to powerful men abusing women and children. You can take it also into the church where you have pastors and priests using the immense power that they've been given by the Lord to act in his name and use that to oppress and abuse. And so in, in many instances where corruption happened, it is a dynamic of power being abused and being in hands that are not good stewards of power. And when we as Christians get engaged with this issue, we bring to the table a spiritual dynamic. And our Lord Jesus Christ, himself the most powerful human being to walk the earth, showed us that the safest hands or the safest way to hold power is to serve other people. And he went about washing his disciples' feet. And he was God, washing you, your feet and my feet. And in that sense, we have a lesson as churches, as Christians, that we can bring into the anti-corruption debate and bear witness to the way in which power might be redeemed, power might be used, rather than to crush or to beat down others, but to use it as a way of saving them. And so it is the case that uh, as the church, we can ask, what can we do? I think for the basic level, we can make sure that those people that we deploy into government, into business, into any part of society, are people who know how to use power. And as Michael says, if we deploy people into positions of influence and authority, and they don't know this basic lesson about power, we have failed our nation, we have deployed people into those places only for them to betray the hopes of the nations. There are experiments on the continent where evangelical Christians became president and did exactly the same thing that others have done, uh, even uh, in spite of the fact that they have evangelical faith. So it isn't merely by being Christians that we can make a difference, but it is by understanding what Moses had to understand. When he looked at the burning bush, he came this close to raw power. And the voice said to him, don't get any closer. Take off your feet, your shoes, because the place is sacred where you are. And that is my sense of what this power is. Those who get close to power must take off their shoes because they are dealing with something that only God has the right to hold. If we hold it, it better be a seventh. And I, I wish I had more time because the challenge of, of corruption is one that is big about which we must talk at length. But my brother here is telling me I have zero minutes left <laughs> and I shall vacate the table. <laughs> It's a real privilege uh, to be here uh, on this uh, effectively second launch. We think this must be the most launched campaign in the history of Christian campaigns, uh, and we're very proud of it. At the turn of this millennium, year 2000, 189 nations gathered together under the directive of the United Nations and made a very auspicious set of promises to the world's poorest people. It was an audacious idea that we ought to half extreme poverty by the year 2015, that we would do that through eight incredible promises called the Millennium Development Goals. Statisticians and those who really do know what they're talking about suggest that it would cost the world approximately $210 billion per annum to stay on track. But each year the world loses something in the proximity of one trillion dollars through corruption, bribery, theft of public services, a lack of transparency, taxation laws which circumnavigate 
these systems in our nations and constantly and consistently rob the poorest of the poor. I think another miracle is taking place, and it is that the church has discovered its own God-given impatience for this kind of tragedy, this scourge which is marring the image of God in people's lives and livelihoods and lifestyle. And the church is saying, we think God has called us to shine a light on corruption. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is precisely what Expose is about, and that's why we are here today. Those figures and the atrocity of corruption is incredibly overwhelming. 25% of Africa's GDP goes through that uh, disruption of Africa's livelihood. And so Exposed is gathering a wide family of Christians from Africa, from across Asia, the Americas, the Caribbean, and here in South Africa and across Africa to say, we feel that God has called us to do three things. We want to challenge the church that we have a responsibility to respond. I don't know what you think about the church. Somebody once said that the church is a little bit like Noah's Ark. It's a bit smelly on the inside, but it's still a lot safer than what's happening outside. That's true enough, <laughs> depending on, of course, on your tradition. But we think that we must start with the church. The church needs a shake up and exposed, doesn't point a finger at the world without first believing the fact that judgment begins at the house of God. We want to challenge as well businesses and we want to challenge our governments. We want to see 100 million Christians across the world engaged in this fight against corruption. And our attention over the next six months is to move towards the 14th to the 20th of October when we hope to see over 2,000 vigils with Christians meeting across the world in prayer gatherings, not just to have a warm, glowing feeling inside and to sing Kumbaya, but actually to focus our prayers and our attention on the lack of public services and the atrocity which corruption causes at the grassroots and ground level. And we want you to join us as we see one million signatures signing up to say, we want to shine a light on corruption. That's what this evening is about. And these figures are huge. The challenge is enormous. We are not naive. We know it's a great demand, but neither are we neutral. We want to get involved. We want to get involved as we challenge governments and we take on big issues, but also we will discover that the big issues are tackled at the grassroots level, where people live and wrestle with these issues and see change come about. In terms of the South African church, what do you think could be maybe the practical things that we can do? I mean, I'm a minister myself, you know, and I'm involved in the marketplace as well. So what advice, what practical steps? Because as you know, it, it tends to be overwhelming. We heard um, um, one of the speakers as well, Choi Stong, saying that as an individual, this can seem quite overwhelming. You almost don't know where to start. And as a minister, where do you start to begin this process? of, um, of um, empowering your people to know more about it, to be more activist or whatever approach. But where, where would you think uh, is the best place to start and how can they go about this? Yeah, you know, I think we recognize that it's a massive problem. So, you know, we're not naive, but neither are we prepared to be neutral. And so uh, the heart of this campaign is, is both to enable as well as to showcase good ministries where this is already happening. And you have a shining example right here in South Africa in Unashamedly Ethical, which is really challenging individuals to look at the condition of our own heart, our values, to look at the world of business, and indeed to look at the world of government. And it starts by the kind of very powerful accounts we've had here this evening. Michelle, Graham Power, talking about how they as Christians brought wholesome values to their own business practices, avoiding shortcuts, not cheating in procurement. But on a very, very basic level, uh, individuals who have the courage to say no to a bribe, who are willing to, uh, to do the right thing by their tax returns. <laughs> These very simple things where honesty and integrity comes to our homes, to the workplace, to our streets. If you're a Christian policeman, you do not bribe 
in order to carry out your duties. And so we're saying this response is not about huge, um, vague ideas in the clouds. This is about challenging people on the ground to look into their own hearts and practices and see where real change can and should occur. What would you say to, to, to someone who would say, well, the church's role really remains inside the church, in the confines of a church, and the, whether it's a pastor or whoever is leading, his role remains in the pulpit, speaking to the, um, to the audience that's in front of him, and that's really where we should, where should stay. And maybe the um, politics and the marketplace and business is outside really of our scope. What, what, what would you say to that? You know, I I imagine a time when... Um, there was no distinction to be made between the church and business and politics and they were all one and the same thing. At that time, 500 years ago, a man called Martin Luther went up to the doorpost of a castle and nailed 95 ideas about a better world and a better church. And that's what Christians call the Reformation. And that wasn't just about a theological revolution, it was fundamentally an anti-corruption campaign. It was the biggest anti-corruption campaign the world has ever seen. And I think to look at the life and the work of someone like a Martin Luther, and then to begin to understand that Christians belong in the church and pastors belong in the church, but actually we are parents, we are policemen, we're accountants, we are politicians, and our lives follow us beyond the doorposts of the church. And therefore, any pastor or church leader who vaguely understands his or her calling cannot allow that ministry to be caged in the pulpit. It belongs on the pavements of our society. And so this campaign will challenge people to take the message of redemption, whole life living, to the pavements of our society, which is why when the campaign reaches its culmination, 14th, the 20th of October this year, we want to see 2,000 vigils across the world, not just pious gatherings of kumbaya and candles. But how do we worship and gather around and celebrate around the idea that in our public services, we have a responsibility to take the truth of God's goodness and honesty and integrity outside in the world. That's the pastor at his or her best. When I think about Africa, which is rated as the most co corrupt continent in the world. And I think of Transparency International, which reports that South Africa, four years ago, was the 45th least corrupt country in the world. We dropped from 45 to 54 to 59 to 64, and now we've just dropped to 69th least corrupt in the world. In four years, we've dropped by 25 places. A whole lot of African countries, we were the second least corrupt. Botswana was the least. We were the second least corrupt uh, nation in Africa. We have dropped to, I think, the fifth or sixth least corrupt, and that in the space of four years. I am not surprised when I look at our newspapers and I see what's going on every day. What do you think churches should be doing or could be doing more to deal with the issues of society, but particularly corruption? I, I think the church should not uh, just function as a formal institution on Sundays and within certain boundaries. I think the church should be a living, pulsating force in the community. Uh, Christianity should be a lifestyle rather than an activity. And one of the things that the church maybe has failed to do is to be the light it is supposed to be and to be the salt it is supposed to be in, in, the, in their communities. I think it's important for the church to go into the marketplace, otherwise the marketplace will get into the church. If we don't get into the world, the world will get into the church. And so one of the things that has happened is that while we are worshipping on Sunday, we have forgotten to get into the world and transform it, and eventually corruption and all the other things begin to be manifest in the church as well. So the church needs to step out, get into the world, and begin to be a transforming influence. Secondly, I think that the church should uh, uh, change its focus on uh, discipleship. I think we shouldn't just disciple people to go to heaven. We should disciple people to go into the world, like Jesus said. And that means creating marketplace uh, people, people who can influence 
their spheres, their areas of activity and begin to shine the light there. Whether they're a headmaster, whether they're a policeman, uh, whether they're a school teacher, they need to begin to be active in their sphere of influence and begin to bring a bearing uh, on how things are done there. So I think those are some of the things that uh, the church should do. And of course, uh, back home we had a, de a, a debate on should the church be involved in politics and governance. And we found that when the church stood away from being involved in the governance of a nation, the nation will begin to rot. It will begin to be corrupt. And so we as a church in Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Heads of Christian Denominations, we wrote a document called the Zimbabwe We Want. And we, in it we said on page three that politics and governance is such of a, a, a powerful force and of such impact in the lives of many people, it cannot be left to politicians. And therefore the church must be involved, not necessarily in the politics of power, but by politics we mean in the governance of the nation. And that will affect the issues of corruption as well. What is, your, what is the attitude like of the churches, of uh, um, spiritual leaders such as yourselves? Um, are, you, are you feeling despondent about everything? Are you encouraged? What, 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 is, your, what is the feeling there? No, the church has to be the hope of the world. It has to be the light. When the church is despondent, what hope is there for the world? So in Zimbabwe, we are not challenged, yes, but not despondent. Absolutely not. The church has been engaged, has been engaging the political process and has been instrumental in bringing transformation. The church is engaged in the issues of, of uh, uh, fighting corruption, for instance, to the extent that the Anti-Corruption Commission invited the church to lead the nation on the United Nations Anti-Corruption Day. It was the church that was in the forefront. Uh, we sent out a letter to every church in the nation to be read on one particular Sunday, denouncing corruption. So uh, the church is positive. The church is uh, united and the church is moving forward in participating in the transformation of Zimbabwe. We are not saying it's going to be easy, but we are committed, we are positive and we are engaged. Now, now do you think it's significant, Graham, that today is the 11th of March that we are having this event exposed here in Cape Town, but on the 3rd of March in Rustenburg, the deputy president of the ANC, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, made the call, a call and he said to the church, uh, uh, the church has to fight corruption and rape in this country and become the moral conscience of the nation. So a few days later, you're having this event. It's almost like God is speaking to the church. God is speaking to Christians. And here is an event um, initiated by Christians and the church to do that very thing. Let me say that I am encouraged by our new deputy president, Sir Ramaphosa, and he's challenged to us as the church. We need to take this serious. We need to take that uh, to heart and we need to say, what are we going to do as a church, as Christians in this nation, the majority grouping by far, and what are we going to do with that challenge? So I'm excited about it. I think this is one of a number of initiatives which we need to take to heart and say, come on, we can make a difference. Well, I was very encouraged when I saw Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa say that. We haven't heard anything like that out of the ANC. Uh, since they took power, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not saying there are no Christians there, but, but, but we have not had anyone so clearly identify a call to the, the category of people in this country who call themselves Christians. We are 79.8% of this country who profess to be Christians, who call ourselves Christians. Sir Ramaphosa was saying, will this 79.8% stand up and make a difference? We all agree that corruption is a massive threat to our nation. But the question on most people's mind is, well, Christians in particular, is what can I do practically to begin fighting against this scourge in our nation? Yeah, thanks uh, for that question. Um, I think there are three things I can think of just uh, off the cuff of. The first one is that Christians should be able at a personal level to make the right choices, ethical choices themselves. I think it starts there. Um, if we aren't able to make those tough personal choices ourselves, it's very difficult to expect that from, of others. And unfortunately we've seen a lot of cases where when Christians were put in positions of power, they have not shown themselves to be different than the world in terms of that, whether within the church, if you're a pastor or a leader in the church, 
often the power, hunger, and the, and the abuse of power has been there. And so I think the pe- first choice, the first thing, is personally to make the, the decision that if God entrusts you with power, you will use it to serve other people. So, so you're saying it starts with us first, before we had all the campaigner. Exactly. The second thing, it's very important to connect with others. Uh, you can't fight this beast alone. You have to hold hands with others. And that's the reason that uh, organizations such as Expose are very important as instruments to bring about such, a, such, a, such hope. In, in our communities. And so if you can find um, connections with other Christians through agencies such as Expose or other agencies in your community that are doing uh, the work of anti-corruption, sign up, connect and, and, and join up uh, with others so that the voice and the, and the vibe of doing something as a movement becomes important. Thirdly, I think uh, the, one of the simplest things that action steps that concretely Christians can do is simply to become part uh, at a local level if you want to do make a difference in education for example become part of the school governing board that is a very important area in which you can help to bring about oversight to what is going on in our schools Uh, you can also begin to get involved in in, in, the, in the police forum, for example, in uh, helping to hold the police accountable so that we don't have the sort of things that happened with the Mozambican national who was killed by unaccountable police. And all of these, I think, are possible to the degree that people don't hold those in power accountable. Uh, and that can go all the way up to local government, provincial government, to national government. Uh, we have a opportunities in South Africa to participate in governance and I think too often Christians don't take advantage of public participation processes or or just ways by which government creates opportunities for people to engage. So I think we could in that way. Martin Kla of TISA, thanks for speaking to us at Watchman on the Wall. Thanks a lot Errol, thanks a lot, it's been great being here. Welcome back to the program. Well, Bongani, I think that was probably one of the most important initiatives to be launched in South Africa because corruption is currently one of the greatest threats against South Africa's future stability and economic prosperity. Yeah, for me as well, when you, uh, often people when they look at corruption and the big numbers that are mentioned, how big it is, uh, um, you know, it's billions and people can't quantify these figures. It looks like it's a huge problem and you often feel you don't know what to do, you don't know what you can do, you feel helpless. So an expo- a campaign such as Exposed uh, 2013 uh, that we just w- uh, witnessed and we enjoyed ourselves when we were there and uh, it's really a brilliant campaign, is a campaign really that is there to equip people, to empower people so that each and every individual can participate because at the end of the day all of this is going to affect you one way or the other. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important important things that we want to stress in this program is that corruption is out of control in South Africa. Many people believe that and I think they're not far wrong. Uh, 26 billion rand going missing, uh, government ministers using the public purse like it, it's their own personal money. Uh, also in Kandla, the 240 million uh, that was spent on the uh, president's private residence, all of these things are in the media continuously to remind us that South Africa is really facing some serious challenges and problems. And what Expose is helping uh, us do is help people get involved in this, help people um, or empower them so that they can become part of the solution in South Africa rather than just staying at home and complaining about what is happening in our nation. Yeah, also, I mean, if you, are, if you look at the problems that are mentioned and the statistics that are around uh, and how much it, it costs uh, if you, to fix the problem of unemployment that we have in South Africa, um, education, crime, and also the housing problem, those four problems, you need about 55 billion rand per annum to address them. Now, that sounds like a big number, but then again, if you add up the cost of corruption, the 26 billion rand that you mentioned that um, has been lost in government, and also recently 29 billion rand um, that has been uh, um, as a result of the tender rigging in the construction industry. All of those figures alone, they already address 
uh, those problems that we're having. So there is money around. It's just a matter of that money being used efficiently, of that money being used properly by those who are in authority. And it is right that every citizen should hold those people who are in those positions, we should hold them accountable. I think that's the most important point here, and that's what Exposed is all about, is empowering people to get involved and helping them hold government accountable to how they use public funds. Because public funds has been used, uh, and as you mentioned, there is enough money in South Africa. I firmly believe that. But how it is being spent is the issue at hand. Uh, they, we need clinics, we need hospitals, we need schools, we need all kinds of things. We have the money for it, but if 26 billion rand is thrown down a pit and could be used for all these things, then of course we're facing a major problem in South Africa. And my encouragement, Bungani, is to the viewers out there, to Christians out there, ordinary people, please do something to get involved and expose. You can go to their website, which is? Exposed uh, 2013.com. Expose 2013.com, the uh, uh, website address will come up at the bottom of your screen. Go on there and find out how you can get involved. Uh, we're also asking people to pray because yes. uh, it is a serious problem. If you look at the moral decline in our, our nation and if you take the corruption and put it alongside that, that is probably two of the major problems facing South Africa and could undermine our future. And we've got to tackle both things as the church, uh, the, the moral decline and corruption in South Africa. Both of them are huge giants threatening uh, South Africa's future stability. Yeah, um, I often hear people talking about church, how church is not doing what it's supposed to be doing and how, you know, we must change this model of church being on Sunday only. Church should be throughout the week and so on and so forth. Yes, that's true. But also, if you, if you, if you go further with that argument, then therefore church should also be involved in these issues, um, these issues of corruption. Pastors out there, we urge you to address this issue. Make it known to, to the people in your congregation. There's a lot that can be done. For instance, there are campaigns right now in Unashamedly Ethical in South Africa. You can go to the website, there's a platform. You can make a stand, exposed2013.com. There are various campaigns and various things that individuals can do. But also more than that, you live in a community where there's a clinic around you, where there's a, a, um, a, a police station around you. If you are in that community, you should make sure that the police in that police station are doing what they're supposed to be doing. That the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists in that clinic, in your community, they are doing what they should be doing. That's our role we should be doing. They're taking care of those who also can't take care of themselves. Yeah, I think pastors should be preaching about this in their churches, about corruption and about we as South Africans holding our government and our officials accountable and one of the things you mentioned there it's so important because South Africans are known to when they get bad service or if they, even if they see corruption that they will shrug their shoulders and walk off and say wow you know what is this country getting to but we want people to get involved they're not shrug their shoulders and walk away uh, we want them to confront the corruption we want them to confront people that are not giving good service or are being corrupt to expose that because uh, you, even if you're getting people in trouble, you will have to do it because a lot of people say that, you know, we don't want to get the person into trouble. But what that does, it, it's slowly eating away at the economic uh, prosperity of this nation and the future of your children and grandchildren. That's the, the key thing here because poor people are suffering as a result of the corruption. Uh, we're stealing from their future. We're stealing from the, you know, the, the, the public purse that is there to help people and can be used to, is being ferreted away by uh, corrupt individuals. And it is the church's responsibility and every good and decent South African to stand up and say, enough is enough. We have to stand up, we have to do something. And so, exposed is answering the call the heart cry of many south africans what can we do well there's the answer get involved go to the website find out what you can do be vigilant form groups uh, talk about it in your cell groups in your church congregations but do something about corruption in south africa because if we don't our future is going to look very very dim if you've got a comment or suggestion for the show, please email us at info at familypolicyinstitute.com. You can also join our Facebook page by going to Family Policy Institute on Facebook, the group, not the page. Uh, make a request to join and I will let you in. You then can become part of the discussion. 
Remember, we're talking about a number of issues here on Watchmen on the Wall, but I think the most challenging is corruption and the decline of morality in South Africa. I want to challenge you to commit to pray into both these issues, the corruption issue, the decline of morality, because it is harming so many people, especially the family. The breakdown of the family is also a threat to South Africa's stability, and we need you to get involved in that. Remember, keep on praying, keep on standing, and may God bless you.